Yeah, so I am originally from Lebanon, lived all my life there. I uh, did my bachelor's and my master's in nutrition and dietetics over there. I uh, became a licensed dietitian over there and then flew into Miami and did my PhD in exercise physiology and nutrition at the University of Miami. Also, I was a certified personal trainer in Lebanon. And then I also became an ACSM, which is the American College of Sports Medicine Exercise Physiologist Certified, which is also like a certified personal trainer, but like at a higher level, you know, taught at the University of Miami, Miami Dade College, um, nutrition and exercise physiology courses. Um, and initially, I wanted to get into this field because I figured this is my shortcut to get fit and and lean because I've always struggled with being overweight and depression and anxiety and acne and everything you can think of. Little did I know that the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics is like the largest organizing body for the profession of nutrition and they are literally in bed with the food companies and so literally Kellogg's, the sugar companies, Coca-Cola, you go to the, any conference for dietitians or at the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics, they're the ones giving presentations. They have stands selling, you know, confectionaries and cookies and sugary stuff. And we never focused on that. We just followed the curriculum that the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics set forth. And a lot of the world follows what the academy says because like in Lebanon it's a developing country we don't have the resources so I got sucked into the whole low fat high carb uh, dogma and all that matters is the calories in calories out model and I would try to follow it and I, it would never work I would binge develop binge eating disorders emotional eating by the time I started really understanding and you know buying additional books and reading documents reading articles like literally doing the research myself not just paying not just like relying on what our professors are teaching us but like going to pubmed and going to google scholar and looking at all the scientific articles that are published then i realized that there's a lot of articles that they don't bother sharing with us. Our professors just follow what the curriculum is, right? And everybody's scared of going outside of the curriculum because you could literally lose your job. Even to this day, I have dietitians that they know what I do. They agree with me. They personally eat the way that I do, like a keto or carnivore diet, but they will not give it to their patients because they're scared of being reported. You know, it's like, no, 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 I'm too scared. I don't want them to like come after me. It's like, I I can't live like that. <laughs> so, you know, hence why I left and hence why I don't care. I'll, I'll say it the way it is. Um, there is no amount of money you can pay me to live like a hypocritical life. What happened later? I came to Miami and I, I also stopped living as much in survival mode when I came to the States. And so I had more bandwidth freed up to dedicate to research and really be able to get to the root cause of why I'm struggling with weight and all that kind of stuff. And that's how I discovered keto. And from there, uh, read The Plant Paradox by Dr. Stephen Gundry and discovered, wait a second, plants have toxins in them? They have self-defense chemicals? What? <laughs> how can no one even mention it in decades of academia and not just academia like i worked in research at every single major university i've been to three big universities and for my bachelor's and for my master's and for my phd not one of them it never came up so and you know, from there you know started i would still struggle with binge eating so every once in a while I think I'd be doing good on keto but I'd still have cravings because on keto you're still eating some carbs there are still some keto treats here and there are all those things trigger cravings you know the more you eat of them the more cravings you get and every time that would happen I would come across like Mark Hyman and functional medicine and I would read his books or you know read the plant paradox or watch the Joe Rogan interviews with Sean Baker and Paul Saladino and the Petersons and, you know, slowly but surely, I understood the whole picture and then transitioned towards carnivore, and it was the best thing that I ever did. See, the thing is, I even like, I remember one of my professors, I would go see her as a dietitian, like, 
as a client and her as my dietitian outside of school. And, you know, she would just like calculate my calories and be like, okay, those are the calories you need to eat. Um, I remember at one time we were talking about Atkins and, but there was no, I couldn't feel like she was like, yeah, like let's do low carb. Like there was never an enthusiasm on her part to clue me in that that's like a good move, you know, to go into low carb. And so I never really did it. I just always followed what they gave me. And eventually it wouldn't work. And I would always blame myself, you know, be like, well, I'm not following it. You know, I'm, you know, maybe I just need more discipline, blah, blah, blah. And um, with, I also saw a lot of dermatologists for my skin because I struggled a lot with acne. So I did Accutane twice. I did birth control pills. I did um, antibiotics. I did spironolactone, all the topicals. I mean, you name it, I've taken it. I started getting into like alternative um, methods and digging or doing my own research because, okay, the traditional thing wasn't working for my skin. Nothing cleared my skin. And so I, I would spend hours on the internet. And so I came across Dr. Lauren Cordain's book, The Acne Cure, which basically talks about how hunter-gatherer societies never had any acne. Even their teenagers never had any acne. And it introduced me to paleo dieting, which worked, by the way. So I did every time I, I did it one month in Lebanon and it cleared my skin. Not as much though, I not as much as, as when I did the carnivore, because when I was doing the paleo, I was still having fruits. So I was still having, you know, meats and fruits and I'm just built different. Like I, I already felt out of place in Lebanon all my life. I never fit in, you know, I was always too much of a rebel, too much of a feminist, too right. much of, of an argumentative person. Find out what works for you. Your all this education in uh, nutrition and exercise uh, physiology and this sort of thing. And then you say, I'm just not going to be forced to teach this curriculum that doesn't mm. work. Didn't work for me. And it, <laughs> right. the, the research shows it doesn't. No, but it's okay. Here's the thing. I do it as a flipped classroom. So they, they go over the lectures, which are the basics, which, you know, there's only like the basics are the basics, you know, carbs are broken down into glucose and, you know, like sugars and like fiber and starch. Okay, fine. Um, those are like, basic stuff, chem chemistry. So they learn those things. It's fine. It's somewhat based off of the textbook and what they need to know. But when we meet, it's all discussion and Q&A. And so you are allowed as a professor to share your opinions when you get asked questions about everything. And so I definitely share my opinions. <laughs> Again, like I think when you put your standards at a certain level of what you want for yourself, when you raise your standards, it no longer feels like it requires courage when you feel like it's wrong what is being done is wrong it it just, it doesn't feel like a lucrative job position you know and like compared to what you can do as a youtuber as a content creator the sky is the limit like i don't settle i feel like every time i i don't settle i always win yeah. and every time you try to convince yourself that this is good this is whatever you're settling yeah. you you always lose um, one of the main reasons that I do carnivore is like, that's the diet that you're going to have the least amount of cravings on, if any. Um, they just don't exist anymore because cravings are one of the stages of addiction. So you eat an addictive food, it, you have that high. And after the high comes the withdrawal stage, you know, you go back down and you enter that withdrawal stage where you have now cravings and you don't feel too good and low energy, but cravings is a major hallmark. Cravings is simply a reaction to an addictive behavior. You remove the addictive behavior, which is the addictive food, the cravings disappear. And so in a carnivore diet, there is nothing that's addictive, you know? You're not eating anything processed. You're not eating keto treats. You're not eating anything sweetened. Um, and so that's why it takes, but it takes two weeks. So that people need to know 10, 10 days to two weeks for most people for the, 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 like the switch to flip, you know, and to really feel that difference and no cravings whatsoever. Um, and so this is why it's so important to keep that in mind and just stick to it and know that it'll pass if you're struggling in the first few days or whatever like just stick to it at least at least 10 days to 14 days and then it'll be smooth sailing after that
when you're eating meat, you're getting high optimal levels of amino acids and protein. Protein is broken down into amino acids in the body. And amino acids are the building blocks of your brain chemicals that regulate your mood, like dopamine and serotonin, acetylcholine, et cetera. A, a craving is a deficiency in one of those or a bunch of those neurotransmitters or brain chemicals. And so when you have a craving and then you go, you eat something addictive, it's your attempt at boosting levels of dopamine, serotonin, acetylcholine, all those brain chemicals. You're literally just trying to regulate your mood. And so when you're eating tons of protein, you have ample supply of those amino acids and you stimulate your own brain's production of those brain chemicals. And so you're far less likely to feel like you have a deficiency in those brain chemicals that needs to be boosted by some external addictive source. When you exercise, not only do you boost your brain's chemicals production, but not only do you boost it during the activity, but you also stimulate a higher baseline level of those brain chemicals. So now it's not just when you're running that you have all the dopamine and the endorphins being produced. It's also when you wake up in the morning. It's also at rest. It's also when you're not working out. It's like now 24 seven, you literally have fundamentally changed the chemistry of your brain so that now you're always happier. And so like your baseline mood level is elevated. And this is why you see the studies that show that just simple exercise can be just as effective, if not more effective than taking antidepressants. And that's when you're basing it off of the antidepressant medication studies that have been allowed to be published, because we know that there's a huge bias in the public, in the literature where when you have, most of those studies anyway are funded by the pharmaceutical industries. And so when you have studies that don't show any, any advantage, of those drugs for alleviation of depression, they literally will not publish them. The clinical trial um, registration thing where now any study you start, you have to register it. It has to leave a trail where it's like, okay, somebody started that study in that university or that company. What happened? If it never gets published, at least we know that, okay, something happened there. Why didn't did it not yeah. get published? Whenever I say inflammation in the body, it simply means that there's a lot more inflammatory molecules in your blood and circulation. Um, and so there you have more tumor necrosis factor alpha, more CRP or C-reactive protein, more uh, free radicals, all of those chemicals. There is a ton of chemicals that are considered inflammatory. And so you just have a lot more of them overall circulating in your blood and reaching your tissues reducing inflammation means reducing the quantities and the secretion of all of those chemicals into your blood. And I think that's, again, another major reason why I stick to a carnivore diet and why I recommend it is because there are no more aches and pains, you know, like when I'm training hard every day, I don't have to feel sore for, you know, two, three days. I constantly thinking, is it time to do a recovery day? There's none of that. People don't realize how much of those aches and pains and waking up with a sore neck or a sore joint or whatever. That's not you getting older. That's inflammation buildup from the plant toxins that you're consuming, thinking it's healthy for you. I'm doing, I'm preparing for a bodybuilding competition. So I'm doing something a little bit more than what most people would want to do. Um, so I train hard. I do 10 mile runs and I don't do it in one shot so that I don't slack off in the other half of it. So I'll do two sessions of five mile run each, and then I'll do 45 minute weight lifting. And so the focus now is more on fat loss than it is on bodybuilding. So the, this is why it's just 45 minutes weight lifting, but still I'm training to failure um, with my lifts. So those, so those are three sessions. And then on top of that, I am constantly moving. So I have a lot of background activity. I have a desk bike that if you follow my channel, you know how obsessed I am with it. And it's usually behind me, but if I have a podcast, I'll move it away. Um, and every time I'm sitting on my laptop, I'm like, even if I'm, no, if I'm recording, I'm usually sitting here, I'm not moving. But when I'm editing and I'm uploading my YouTube videos, when I'm working on my client meal plans, all the work that I do other than strictly filming, I'm literally cycling. And I love it so much because it's like, I don't feel an effort. So it actually, not only is it great 
to increase overall caloric burn, it's what I've noticed is that it allows me to stay focused on the task a lot better than if I were to just, just be sitting down. Because mm -hmm. I, I have a lot of like ADHD tendencies. So I want to constantly be moving and that keeps me occupied in a way and, and, and literally allows my creativity juices to flow better. So that's for my overall activity. With regards to my diet, it's pretty much the same thing. Eggs and bacon for breakfast, and then I'll do a whole lot of ground beef. And now recently I'm adding to that baby Swiss cheese slices on top. I don't necessarily react. Maybe I do, I'm not sure, but I don't see any outward major negative symptoms from including some dairy. So I'll do baby Swiss cheese slices on top of that. And sometimes I'll do ground beef with some eggs, like um, sunny side up and bacon. Sometimes I'll do salmon, like a huge chunk of salmon with some bacon on the side. So, but, but generally it's been mainly ground beef for the past few weeks. So breakfast and lunch are your two meals? Two meals, two meals. Yeah, I feel like I make them a little bit bigger than usual and that'll allow me, because then it's just, it's just too much time taken away from, from my productivity if I'm eating multiple meals. So I try to just do two meals a day. If I could do one meal, I would, but because I train so hard, I, I can't fit all the protein that I need um, in just one meal. Yeah, I'm pretty good with my form, like paying attention to form. And I rarely use momentum. When I first started lifting, I definitely was guilty of <laughs> a yeah. whole lot of momentum happening all over the place. Right. Um, I feel like over time, especially that I train with my husband and he's also a bodybuilder, like he's on top of me. He's like, I see what you're doing. You know, just take a lower <laughs> weight and do it right. It's like, oh my God, okay. Why do I even come here with you? <laughs> Every once in a while, I'll make sure that I take a session and not worry too much about the total amount of weight that I'm lifting and just pay attention to the technique, yeah. you know, and just go That's a little good. bit slower and easier. And then just making sure is my technique always, like is my form right? And that keeps keeps that 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 mind muscle connection um the done the right way you know so that when you are lifting heavier weights you're still doing it with the right form a client who was 55 years old menopausal um didn't have haven't had periods for a while and started working with me and we did the carnivore diet and she was like i wake up one day because i have client check-ins so every three to four days they have to send me um a check-in email with their fasted weight scale and any and actually they we also have unlimited email support so we're constantly in communication even throughout so one day one of these days i wake up and she has this email she's like you won't believe what happened i got my period back and then a month later she gets her period back again and it's this is literal reversal of aging this means your body went back to pumping out the hormones, the sex hormones that are crucial for overall health. I mean, it's crucial for bone density, for, for everything. You're literally seeing an, a reversal in the aging process. And so I thought that that was mind blowing. Um, another student that was a student of mine, um, she was taking my class and I'm always talking about the carnivore diet. She, she got excited and started it and in two weeks reversed her lifelong psoriasis. And, and like, she couldn't believe it. I was like, okay, let's tell, tell the class. And she shared the, with the class, uh, like all the symptoms and everything. And her name is Franey. And I think I posted her on my, on my website because I was like so excited. So, you know, I see things like that all the time. You know, my husband's low back pain completely resolved the moment he took out spinach, lifelong low back pain that was crippling to the point where he was about to get a surgery that was risky. And he really, really tried hard to keep postponing it because it was like so close to the spine, high, had risks in it and already like had got to a point where he scheduled like the the whole appointment and everything. And that was around the time where I was into carnivore and like, you know what? The only plant food you eat is just spinach. So, I mean, you're already eating animal base, might as well take that out. And lo and behold, who knew spinach was yeah. the cause of debilitating low back pain. And by the way, he has a bulging disc, like on the scans, the bulging disc is still there. Like the mechanical problem is still there, but it was the inflammation from the spinach yeah. that was causing the low back pain because spinach had something called aquaporins. I'm going to prepare a video on my channel and it's going to come out in a few days on that. 
And so it turns out it's the aquaporins that he's reacting to. Well, I wasn't sure what it was at first. And everybody was like, maybe it's the oxalates. Like the moment you Google spinach, it's like oxalates, right? But because he also had the, the low back pain came back with a vengeance after a few months of not having low back pain, it was because we went to North Carolina, our in-laws made um, corn pudding for Thanksgiving and he ate the corn. And it turns out that aquaporins are found in spinach, corn, soy, and tomatoes. Corn doesn't have the oxalates. It can't be the oxalates. Right. He doesn't react yeah. to anything else that has oxalates. It's got to be the aquaporins. 